1 John. And I want to let you turn there as I get to uh, sorting some things out here. Chapter 4. You know, when I get singing some of these songs, it, some people go to the gym to get a w- ab workout. My abs hurt because of that last song, you know, so uh, that's neither here nor there. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Driving out deception. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many, and uh, I have that circle in my Bible, many false prophets are gone out into the world. And hereby know you the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. There's there's a difference. There's a distinction between they and we. Verse 6. We are of God. And he that knoweth God heareth us. He uh, He that is not of God heareth not us. And hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time to be gathered around your word and Lord, again, to be helped. Lord, I just pray that you'll help me as I preach this message this morning. Lord, that you'll just help us to have wisdom and understanding as we see that we, we cannot believe every single spirit in the world. We, we cannot believe just everything that we hear from uh, other, other places, Lord, whether it's the TV or the radio. And Lord, I wish it was so. But Lord, you know, as this Paul would say, some pe- preach Christ out of envy and strife. But he's praising the Lord that it's even preached at all. Lord, I ask you to help me to preach this message by your Spirit and with your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Driving out deception. Why is it important to know your Bible? Why is it important to know your Bible? I know it's probably not necessarily the greatest thing to start out a message with a question, but really when I come to this passage of Scripture... And I look here what John is trying to get across to us, and he says that there's going to be many false prophets coming to this world. I realize that we need to know our Bibles more than anything. And of course, we, we, we we're afraid of the pandemic and everything, of COVID-19 and everything else. And, and yeah, I know the Scripture where God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love. And I understand that. But more than the COVID-19, I believe that the greatest pandemic in this world that, 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 that is a condemnation to many churches as there's a, a pandemic of biblical illiteracy here in the church. And, and it's amazing to me that we can go out and knock on doors, and I've done this on several occasions, and you ask people the simplest verse and all the verse that everybody should, the very first one that the kids memorize. John 3.16, you ask them, hey, do you know know John 3.16? They'll say, well, yes. And you ask them to quote it to you, and they stumble over the words. Yeah, I know it's in the Bible somewhere. (laughs) They've heard it, but they they don't know anything about it. You you ask them about some of the... the, We pick out a well-known verse out of Psalm 23. They say, yeah, you know, have you heard of Psalm 23? Oh, yeah, I've heard of it. Can you find it in the Bible? No, they can't find it in the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And, and, and they begin to go down the, the verses and, and you got to help them along because the people are ignorant of not only Bible doctrine, but just Bible verses in general. They, they can't name you one thing in the Bible, yet they'll use it to try to prove their points and say, oh, you shall not judge. That's the only verse that they can find in the Bible. <laughs> don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. And yet one day they'll stand before their judge. Isn't that amazing? But the Bible will help us to increase our faith. It will help us to uh, live a victorious Christian life, the Spirit-filled life, and it will help us to discern truth from error. And we've got to be careful because the devil, on many different occasions, seeking in all of his ways to tear us down and to bring in false doctrine in, into the church and bring dissension and, and, and discord and sow it amongst the brethren. That's what the devil tries to do. 
He tries to use it to cause doubt in the hearts and minds of the believer and where there used to be joy and hope and peace within. Next thing you know, they're all distraught about what's going on. Pastor, are we in the tribulation? No. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> well, don't you see what's going on in the world? But that doesn't mean anything. It matters what the Bible says. But you know, if we don't know our Bibles, it's easy for the devil to plant that doubt into the hearts and the lives of people. And to cause that, that, that disheartened uh, feeling into the... Can I use that word feeling? I, I have them. <laughs> feeling into people was in the church. And no, no longer, I mean, they lose that hope, they lose that assurance, they lose everything else. Why? Because the devil's hard at work and we don't know our Bibles and we're not spirit-filled and we're not just able to discern the truth from the air. I mean, they turn on the TV and they, they believe everything that that preacher is saying. They, they turn on the radio and they believe every single word that these guys are spewing out of their mouth without even a spirit of discernment. And here John tells us, he says, you need to be discerning, and especially in this day and in this hour. And we're going to go over that as we look here at these verses. You know, it's on the one hand we could see where not knowing the Bible makes the devil's job easy, but on the other hand, the devil, uh, you know what he can't do? He can't push over somebody who's strong in the Word of God. He can try as he can as he tried to tempt the, the Lord Jesus Christ there in the wilderness for 40, 40, 40 days in the wilderness trying to tempt him. You know, say, well, you know, if you'll just turn these, these, these stones into bread, then you know, you'll have plenty to eat. You can do that since you're the Son of God, right? Yeah, but thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, if you throw yourself down from this temple, you know, the Bible says that those angels will bear you up upon their wings and you'll be just fine and you'll, you'll prove to the whole world that you are the Son of God. Uh, that's not what it's about. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The Bible tells us over in the book of Revelation chapter 12, they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They, they clung to the word of God and then they also tell us in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 9 that we're to resist the devil by being steadfast in the faith. And so it's very vitally important for us to be in the word of God. Paul said that after my departing, and you wonder sometimes why it was after his departing, but he says after my departing so many grievous wolves come in, not sparing the flock, and they just devour them. Isn't that something? After my departing, why could they not? Why did they wait till Paul leave? Because Paul was strong in the word, left and right. We see him pointing out the doctoral error where they've gone astray and where they've failed to, to hear God's word and live by it and, and understand the simplicity of the gospel and where they went astray. And so it's important for us to know the word of God. We must be discerning. How many of you want your children and grandchildren to grow up to be worldly? I don't want that. You don't want them to be worldly. Don't invite error into your house, right? You don't want your children, your grandchildren, you don't want your fellow church member to, uh, to have worldliness into their lifestyle or in their, in their home. You, don't, you, you better know your Bible. And so that's here. So I want you to see, first of all, the scrutiny. The scrutiny, and you know, it's that, that word to try the spirits, it's that, that discernment, the spirit of discernment that's here is what I want to get across to you for the first point. Unfortunately, the devil likes to destroy more from within the church than from without. Have any of you guys ever witnessed something like that? I mean, he'll come in, he'll try to put a little bit of false doctrine in there, and he'll try to sow a little bit. Maybe it's just small amounts, and he'll put it out there, and next thing you know, it spreads very quickly. Did you know this about the Bible? I mean, and they start, everybody starts believing it because they don't know the Word of God and it spreads and takes over the whole church and then they, they, they've lost it. And so he, he spreads this, the, 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 the false doctrine from more from within the church, shows us to score from within the church than he does from without, more so. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people even as there should be false teachers among you. I find that kind of amazing. 
that Peter was saying to these churches here that he's trying to reach and try to assure and try to help along the way the churches in Bithynia and, 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 and Cappadocia and other places that he's writing to. He says that there's some false doctrines, false teachers, false prophets even amongst you. I mean, they had to be like Judas Iscariot and all the rest of them were gathered around the, the, the Lord's Supper table there. And is it, is it you? <laughs> that spirit of discernment. Uh, even there should be false teachers among you who privily, not openly, privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. That verse is a clear attack from within the church. Jude tells us in the fourth, fourth verse, he says, But there are certain men crept in unawares. I mean, they have on their suit, they have on their tie, they have on their dresses and everything else, and they sit and be a part of the, the church, and then they, and believe it or not, there are people out there who train guys to do this and send them out into the churches. Crept in unawares. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we've got to be on guard. On guard in all the forms and fashions of this false doctrine of the false prophets that are here, because it's commanded and given to us to try the spirits. He says, Believe not every spirit. Don't believe every word that you hear coming out of somebody's mouth. The only thing that we can be sure that we can believe is the Word of God that's here. But try, he says, on the other hand, try the spirits whether they are of God. It's not just the, the external works that somebody's doing. Somebody can come out and they can do all the right things, but inwardly, you got to know their words, what they're teaching, what they're preaching. They got to be tried, true. Uh, that's why I guess Paul would say, he said, let not a novice preach the word of God. But here's what you need to realize. Whenever God speaks His word, there are many false prophets who are deployed to counter God's truth. And you see that in the Bible? In verse 1, he says, because many, and again, I have that, that circled in my Bible, because many false prophets are going out into the world. It's not just one. Listen, if I would sit here and try to give you a list of all the people who are spreading this doctrinal error, I'd be here. We wouldn't get the Word of God preached, all right? I mean, we could sit here and name names, but here I'm trying to give you the Word of God. Uh, You've got to be discerning of everybody. It's incredible to me that, uh, you know... Paul, this is not my outline, but Paul would tell those, and uh, as he's preaching in Thessalonica, he's there for three weeks, and he's, he's put out because they're, they're chasing the Judaizers, come and chase them out. And he goes down to Berea, and he says, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures. What are those things? And they say, Paul, they're searching your Scriptures? Paul, they're trying to discern whether you're trying to teach the truth? I mean, if anybody's teaching the truth, it ought to be the Apostle Paul. But they're searching the Scriptures. That's the method of whether we can discern truth from error. It's the Scriptures. It's the Scriptures and the Spirit of God and so forth. But they were searching even the Apostle Paul, his words. This is, Many false prophets are going out into the world. And the passage of Scriptures about combating error... And you cannot have a healthy church or a happy Christian so long as error is being entertained and even endured, even for a moment. Even just a small amount for a little bit of time can be great danger. There are many false prophets who are sent to overflow the, overthrow the faith of many as they can. And it's not speculation. Paul told young Timothy... He tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When he says rightly dividing it. Anybody can divide Scripture, but are they rightly dividing it? But shun, on the other hand, you need to study, but also shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. It's not going to get better, Timothy. You need to shun it. You need to, to stop it. Put it. Stop it right in its tracks before it spreads any further. Shun profane babblings because it will increase in the more ungodliness. And you want to know the way to spot whether deceptions got into the church? Because of un ungodliness that abounds. Because of the ungodliness amongst the people that sit in the pews. 
And, and don't think that the pastor is exempt from that because there are some pastors that practice ungodliness. And there were we it is not the canker of whom is Hermenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection's all past already and overthrow the faith of some. Does that sound familiar? You get over to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and what are they worried about? Uh, Paul, did we, uh, did we miss the rapture or something? Did uh, we miss the resurrection? Or... And Paul writes to them. But he tells them, he says, you need to prove all things, to hold fast only to those things which are good. Prove all things. Don't accept it at face value. Prove all things, to hold fast to that which is good. He tells uh, 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 Titus chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, he says, holding fast a faithful word as he had been taught. And here's the, he's addressed to the, the bishop, the pastor, that he might be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, is what he says. These are the Christians, the same one that Paul warns young Titus. He says, they're always like They're slow bellies. Liars. They have a reputation. It must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, for, for, for money's sake. And that subverting means that they, they go in. I mean, when a robber comes in your house, they're not looking for your junk, are they? They're looking for the best you have. I mean, they go in, they look for your cash, the gold, and everything else. Subvert means they go in as robbers and take over those things which are good and turn everything upside down and search only for those good things and leave everything in disarray. That's what they do in the church leave only destruction in their path. Many are those who fall prey to the attacks of the devil. And Paul warns the Galatian churches, the Judaizers, who were overthrowing their faith with legalism. And Jesus rebukes the church of Pergamos because of those who hold the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, which the Bible says God hates. How long are you going to put up? If you continue to put up with the deeds of the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, I want to remove your candlestick. Tells another church, he says, uh, shame on you guys for suffering a, a little Jezebel to come in and destroy your church. This thing's all not so to be. He says, I'll judge her and I'll judge all the servants of her. Remove your candlestick if you don't repent. Those who are coming in and preaching that false doctrine. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. And here John warns of the heretical Gnostics. Um, they are many. The false prophets are many. They are manipulators of the truth, masters of the craft. They are mobilized by the devil. Notice that these false prophets are gone out into the world. That word world is used five times in these six verses. It's really significant because it shows where they come out of and it's who they are. It's where they, I mean, as it says in verse 5, it says they speak of the world and the world will hear them. I mean, that's their company that they keep. But the phrase going out into the world comes from the same Greek word that we find in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus has given the great commission unto the disciples, and it says this, And they went forth and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following them. Amen. And so Jesus gives them the great commission, and immediately and, and quickly and obediently, they go out and they start preaching the gospel everywhere that they go. The same word. That's used as the disciples going out and spreading the gospel is the same word of these false prophets going out and spreading the great commission of the devil. And so it's coming, the, the, all this is coming from the motive that, the, the, I mean, the devil is blind to the minds of them and they're lost, right? And they continue to believe the lies and spread it and propagate it and they'll tell you everything under the sun except for the truth. I'm saying they've been commissioned. They're doing it on purpose. They know what they're doing. And it's the lies of the devil. The perfect tense of the verb means that it's just a continual action. It's even more so today, I believe. You just All you have to do is open up a Christian bookstore magazine and go through and look at some of the books that are in there. All you have to do is turn on a TV. All you have to do is listen to a radio. And you know it's there. They haven't stopped in our day and age. We need to be discerning. 
They've been mobilized and they have a method to draw people into their lives. These false prophets, deceitful workers, they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, there's no great thing of his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end should be according to their works. How do they come in? They smile. They dress right. I mean, they, they have a feel-good sort of a theology to them. I mean, they come in as ministers of light. They don't come in with their worst. They come in with a little bit of deceit. A little bit of God. How did, how did the devil get into the Garden of Eden? It says that he was more subtle than all the beasts of the field, does it not? That's these guys. If they can deceive Adam and Eve... Let's not think that we're better than them. Jesus warns over and over again of, of this deception, this deceit. Jesus says, beware the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. And he says in another place, he says, the leaven of the Pharisees, as they're there on the boat, and they begin to think, where Jesus says, hey, do you have any bread? And they say, oh, it's because we forgot the bread back at the... They said, no, I'm telling you about the doctrine of the Pharisees. But where are the living of the Pharisees because it's hypocrisy is what he tells them. They have a form of righteousness, but they're denying the power of God. A form of godliness, but denying the power of God. And Jesus tells them to beware of it. Yeah, it looks good. It looks like they're religious. It looks like they're better. I mean, they pray, they fast, they tithe, they, they do all these works, but it's hypocrisy. They have an appearance of the gospel, but it's not the gospel. It says, Beware the leaven of the Sadducees. They were the modernists and the liberals of their day, and they would go out and question everything about the Bible. That wasn't really the Red Sea that the children of Israel crossed over. They didn't really march around the wall seven days, and it came down. It was an earthquake or something else happened, and if you do this, this, and this. Uh, Jesus didn't really literally bodily raise again from the dead. That's not possible. Don't you know science? And they question the Bible. They question God and they question the, the, God's supernatural nature. His truth. And this is the same group that's questioning the Bible that says, well, you know, uh, we got to get together with a bunch of our scholars and tell you which things we ought to study and things we got to know. And I mean, we got to reinterpret what Paul said because he really didn't know everything back in his day and age. And so we can reinterpret it and make sure that it's right. That same modernists. Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of Herod, he tells them, those who are trying to build a kingdom, which is nothing more than this devoid of Christ and His Holy Spirit. All those, I'm sure did you heard it, because it's one of those big things that are out there. And he said, yeah, we're, we're building the kingdom. The last time I checked, Jesus said, I'll build my church. And He didn't need our help, right? Full of politics and not, not a spiritual life in them. All worldliness that they have instead of godliness. Peter warns in the second epistle, chapter 2, he says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of the way of truth uh, shall be spoke, evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words. Not with plain words. It's amazing to me that many of those who are putting out their doctrines use the same words that you and I use, and they'll put a different definition of it and make the world believe that that's the right definition, and they changed the same words that you and I are using. With vain words make merchandise out of you. Yes, it sounds great and it sounds lovely, but it's not the truth. i tell you what, I don't want somebody taking advantage of me. You know, I don't want them trying to make merchandise out of me, as Peter calls it here. And how true this is today, people are being made merchandise of, left and right. Yeah, It's amazing to me, you look at some of these televangelists, and they say, yeah, if you'll just send in all this money, I'll, I'll, I'll pray over this handkerchief and send it to you. And, uh, you know, I need all this money because God said I need a jet. That's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. But that's what they're doing. Taking everybody's money left and right. I'm 
I need to stay away from that, to be honest with you. I can go down a, I can go down a rabbit hole and chase it all day long. But a wise man will carry out John's command. He says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have God. And it's amazing to me, you know, that uh, people will go out and they... they, they of course, you, I, I know this from experience. You've got to password protect everything when you get on the internet. I mean, you want to protect yourself, you've got to guard yourself, make sure you keep track of the passwords, change it three days a week, and keep track of even all of these, and you've got to put f- passwords to your passwords and everything else to protect yourself because you know that people are trying to take your money. They try to steal from you. And we protect ourselves from, from, from those who we know that can steal your information off the internet, but we don't protect ourselves against false doctrine. What is that? We know if we go into a foreign country and you're there as a tourist and maybe you're going into Rome or uh, someplace like that or I don't know where, you, you might go down to Egypt checking out the pyramids. And there's always going to be somebody over there and they say, wow, we got this straight from the pyramids over there. We chipped this off and here's a piece of the pyramid and we'll sell it to you for 50 bucks and all the while they just picked it up from the ground. Now, why can they do that? Why? Because you're ignorant. You don't know it. You don't know it. And again, we're told to try all things. If I buy a ring, I want to take it to the jeweler. I want to make sure it's 24 karat gold and not one of some fool's gold. You know what I mean? But the word try here in our text, it means to, to listen to and to take in and to, you know, just to, to try it by the Word of God. To try it by the Word of God. It refers to spiritual discernment. It's theological in nature. And it's intended that every believer is to listen with discerning ear to ensure against any heresies being taught. And our attitude ought to be like the Bereans, again, to search the Scriptures daily whether those things are so. A wise man will be discerning. And we do that through scrutiny, but we also have a standard in trying the spirits of God. The standard for the test is found in verses 2 and 3. It says, Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come into flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come into flesh is not of God. Who is Jesus, in other words? Who is Jesus? It's actually a command that's given in Scripture. Whether you know it or not, it says, Hereby know you the Spirit of God. That word, know. Here is how you can know. This is the test that you ought to use. Who is Jesus Christ? And he begins to emphasize this is the standard by knowing who is the Spirit of God and who is the Spirit of Antichrist. It's right here. Who did, they, did Jesus Christ really come in the flesh or not? In Scripture, I believe there's actually four tests in knowing this, whether it's the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Antichrist uh, that John is concerned about here. I believe he's concerned about the faith, the fruit, the family, and uh, fellowship. The first one's found in the second verse, or faith what they believe and what they confess. In John 1.1, 1, 1, what does the Bible say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So it didn't leave any doubt about it. And somebody will come along and say, well, you know, uh, that's probably not right. Because Jesus Christ wasn't divinity, He's, he's called the second person of the, the, the Godhead, but he's not, he's not deity, He's not God. That's what the false deceivers try to tell you. Uh, He was a created being. No, he's not. He really was God. He really was God. That's part of the faith. 1 John chapter 1, he's called the word of life. He's referred to as that eternal life uh, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And the Bible leaves no doubt to the divinity of Christ. But false teachers love to attack the divinity of our Lord. You know one thing I don't like, I don't care for I've had to put up with this. Uh, yeah. People know how to ruffle my feathers from time to time. At least they have over the course of the years. Now, they'll say something bad about my mother, and they'll get me riled up. And I mean, I'm ready to fight. <laughs> I mean, it irks me to no end. Somebody says something about my mother. I, I love her. It bothers me to no end. Somebody says something about Sarah. It even bothers me when, when, when my son, and I love my children, when he began to back talk my wife. I said, listen, that's your mother. You want to listen to her. It bothers me to no end. 
If somebody says something to, to deny my wife or to hurt my wife or say something evil against my wife, and how much more so the Lord that, that bought me with His own blood, how much more so Him? And you think that I don't get upset sometimes when, when, when those who go out and they try to say, oh yeah, we're, we're people of God, we, we're Jehovah's Witnesses and we know all about it. No, you're not. Because a Jehovah's Witness would testify that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, But to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. And so it's that deity, but also that humanity they begin to pull apart is here. And, and the Gnostics that John is here contending with, he says, yeah, I understand that there's some who's going to try to pervert the truth. I want to set it straight here. You ask that person that comes into this church whether they believe that Jesus Christ is God and that He is the Son of God, He's put on flesh. And He died on the cross for every one of your sins. If He doesn't confess that, then He doesn't belong. He needs the gospel and He needs to get saved. They acknowledge the incarnation when God took on flesh and the person of Jesus Christ and died for their sins according to the Scriptures and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Do they confess that? The test of faith is if they can hold you up in good times. And, and, and I'll tell you the truth. I have no doubts about what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. I have no doubts about my salvation. I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is good enough to uphold me, keep me, save me, uh, all the way until I go home. And yes I'll, yes, I'll mess up from time to time, but it's good enough to hold me up. Only this gospel here tells me that God's grace is sufficient to keep me in the hard times and the good times. Only this one gives me the, the assurance of a resurrection to come, that, that this world is not my home. I'm going home one day. But other faiths don't have that. They're going after Allah. They're going after uh, whatever, Buddhists and, and so forth. I mean, they're going after everything else. But this is the only one that's going to uphold you and help you. The faith is important. It must not be excluded. And it's not, well, we, want to, we, we don't want to talk about doctrine because we don't want to offend anybody. Well, doctrine is the only thing that's going to help you. Everyone wants to be a member of this church. They must agree with what the Bible says about here. They must confess the same thing that John says. Hey, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. If you don't know that, then you can't be a member of the church. The Apostle Paul tells him in the book of Galatians as he's dealing with the leaven that's over there. The Judaizers has come in and tried to dissemble. He says, I marvel that you so soon removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is really, it's not another gospel at all because it's not a gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we've preached unto you, what does it say? Let him be accursed. Scripture is the standard of our faith. The second one's implied in our text because of the confession that's being made. They, they confess that Jesus Christ is in the come into flesh, is a, or that He's of God. Confess that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. And word confess is more than just the words that come out of your mouth, and you and I understand that. But it's associated with what they believe about Jesus Christ as well, right? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart that uh, Jesus Christ died... Or, uh, let me just read it here. Confess with thy mouth and the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God had raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And he makes that strong cord between the two. There's, there's belief that goes right along with your confession. It's not just plain words. It's not just something that's uh, you, you say and just to say it. Just, just save your own skin or something like that. Just to fit in. It goes along with your, your belief. There's a public declaration. Because in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, Well, there's some of you. He says, If any of you go out and they say, Well, I'm, I don't know Christ. If you don't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father, for his, before His holy angels. That's what the Bible says. 
If you don't confess me before men, I'm not going to confess you before the, the Father. I mean, that's strong words. It's associated with the public declaration of who you are with, a, with your belief. It's associated with repentance. In some verses, Acts chapter 19, verse 18, it says, Many believed, came, and they confessed and showed their deeds. And this time, this, the Apostle Paul was preaching, and they came under conviction, and they began to bring all their books of witchcraft and sorcery and everything else, brought it to a pile, and burned them all up. Uh, kind of like what they do today. Some of the people will go out and they'll take all the worldly music and throw it all together and all the worldly books and light it and put it in fire. That's what they were doing. John uses the same word first. John chapter 1 verse 7, I believe it is. He says that uh, uh, if any man sin, we have... Any, well, let me turn back there. This is what happens. I told you I have a tiny mind at times. Verse 9 it is. It says, we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That same sort of repentance that's there. Then the distinction. Because of 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul begins to distinguish that there's some of you that might believe in vain. He says, I've preached unto the gospel. It hasn't changed. It's still the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's been witnessed above 500 brethren. And, and this is where our salvation stands unless you believed in vain. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, verse 13 as well, it speaks of a good, good profession and a good confession. Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works... They deny Him being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work reprobate. And Jesus talks about knowing them by their fruits, but I like the verse that's over in John chapter 2, verse 19. So thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. Even the devils believe and tremble. What does that mean? Jesus, the devil's over there on several occasions where they say, we know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. We know who you are. They knew. But they continued to live like devils, didn't they? And there's many people that say, oh yeah, we know Jesus Christ, and they'll continue to live the rest of their life like devils, and, and there's no change. There's no change in attitude or actions or anything else. And if we believe the Bible, your faith will have an effect. It's more than just a confession of words. Something that's real and genuine that produces a work in your life in the inner man. So I feel confident in saying John had to, uh, the fruit as well in mind. The third way is our family. In the fourth verse, we find these words. It opens up. It says, Ye are of God, little children. It speaks of their origin. Uh, the Greek word there really actually means that they came out of or out from, from God Himself. They were born of God. They came out from God. Ye are of God. I like the way the First John puts it in uh, chapter 5. He says, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. They're in the family. Everyone that loveth Him that begot loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. In verse 4 it says, For whatsoever is born of God... They're in the family. They overcome the world. Where is that found? In our verse back here. They've overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. For whatsoever is born of God overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcome the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And because we're in the family, we have something that's greater in us than it's in the world. We, people use that expression over and over again, but uh, sometimes we fail to realize the significance of it. When the devil brings all of his deception and lies in, we have somebody that's greater inside of us uh, because, listen, God seals the believer with the Holy Spirit promise. What's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit? To instruct us, teach us all things, bring things to remembrance, to testify of Christ, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And greater is He who is in you to instruct you and show you that, hey, that this doesn't line up with the Word of God. There's something wrong here. It doesn't make sense. Then He was in the world to cause delusion and, and to bring you into believing a lie. 
you have to first grieve the Holy Spirit and, and, and go against the Holy Spirit in order to do that. And it's sort of like, you know, the fire alarm that goes off and it just beep, 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 beep. We, the other day, we, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, Sarah had something on the stove and the fire detector went off and we had to like, be quiet, it's safe, we're, we're, we're not on fire. And you had to pull it off and try to take the battery out. I put it back in, I was, put it back. But it causes those alarms to go off. Jesus said, On occasion my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and a stranger will not follow, but they'll flee from them, for they know not the voice of strangers. We've got to ask ourselves, whose voice are we listening to? God's greater to uphold than Satan to cast down. The Bible says that we're in a spiritual warfare. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. And therefore, we're to take on the whole armor of God. God's given us everything we need in order to, to combat the wiles of the devil, to fight against those attacks that he fires at us. And so we're to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul knew these battles in a real way. He told uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be... Or his servant. Peter wrote in the second epistle, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of the temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And Satan desired to sift Peter as wheat, but the Lord wouldn't suffer his faith to fail. And God is greater also, God is greater to save than Satan to destroy. I like what the psalmist said. He said, If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. I said that on many different occasions. If it had not been for the Lord that's on our side, where would I be? Where would our church be if it had not been for the Lord who's on our side? They can put out all the false doctrine that they want to, but if it had not been for the Lord, I thank God that He stands strong and, and protects and keeps, but we got to do our part in studying and knowing the Scripture, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. we got to do our part. Our God's a mighty one to save. No condemnation can stand against us. No man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And though rain may descend, the floods may come, the winds may blow, and beat upon the house. And the Bible says it: the house stood because it was founded upon a rock. And as long as we stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ, we'll stand. But we need to be discerning. I had a thought, and probably not a good one to share at this time. And, uh, well, not, let me just say it. I had a friend, uh, you know, he was at the last church, old man, and he said this. And he said, well, I heard that the Bible says that God only helps those who help themselves. Right? You heard that before? Well, this, this applies in this instance right here. He'll help you, but you need to be studying the Word. He said, you can't be foolish. you got to do your part as well. you got to do your part as well. Study. Be spirit-filled. Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world, and we don't need the devil's baloney. The spirit of Antichrist is of the world. They speak of the world. They are accepted of the world, but we have no stake in this world, which is perishing. We've come out from among them. I like what the Bible tells us in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, if you come out from among them, if you touch not the unclean thing, I'll, I'll receive you unto myself. I'll be a father unto you. You should be my sons and my daughters. I love that expression. And we can't put up with all the false doctrine. Then there's the fellowship. Where of God he knoweth, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The Bible keeps things simple, doesn't it? That's not very hard to understand. Paul says, if you're not hearing my words, if, you, if they don't confirm the things I say unto you, he's telling you a lie. Get them out of your church. 
John tells him here, he says, if you don't speak the same things I'm telling you about Jesus Christ, get him out of the church. He's a false prophet and a false doctor. With a false doctor. Don't suffer it. He tells Second John chapter. Go over there real quick. I, I like this. Second John, uh, he's 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 called the disciple of love, the apostle of love, isn't he? But he was a strong man. He tells him in, in verse seven. There's only one chapter here. It says, for many deceivers are entered into the world, confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourselves, we lose not the things which we have wrought, but we have received a full reward. And whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now get this, verse 10. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive them not in your house. And what's that next phrase? Neither bid him Godspeed. For he who bid him Godspeed is partaker of his deeds. If he's, he, he's really a man of God, if he's really preaching and teaching the truth, he'll confirm the words that I say unto you. He'll line up with the Scriptures and watch his words. Watch his words. I want to move on down to the separation. The Bible tells us how to handle false prophets. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Titus 3.10 A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject him. In other words, if you've been to him once, okay, you've been to him second time, he don't get a third shot. It's not three strikes, you're out. Second time, you're done. You don't listen to me after the second time, reject that man. You don't keep any company with him. And it's plain talk. We ought not to keep company with false teachers, preachers, prophets, or anything else. I, I, you know one thing that I would beware of? You know, is, this might sound bad to me to say. But just hear me out. Somebody comes up to you and says, well, let's have a Bible study together. And they don't line up with the Word of God. I'd be careful of that. I'd watch out for that. You want a Bible study, I'm free anytime. I'm willing to help you with the Word of God. I'll back up Scripture with Scripture. I'll, I'll do all that I can to help you out. You don't need to be having Bible studies with anybody else. And, and I'm not saying that selfishly. I'm saying that because I care about you and I don't want you to believe all the lies that are in the world. False doctrine will steal your joy. It will fill your head with doubt and it will smother your hope. And then the success. One way to combat error is to give yourself wholly to knowing God's Word. The Bible, Paul told young Timothy, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading. And that reading is of the Bible, by the way. Give attendance unto reading and exhortation to doctrine. Doctrine is not bad for you. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly unto them, that that property might appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them they hear thee. You ever hear Dr. Spencer preach? He'll use this word. <laughs> this is one that he pounded in my head while I was at Bible college. Take heed unto thyself, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save thyself and them they hear thee. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Study God's Word and obediently live it. Fellowship with the people of God. And surround yourself with the right people. I don't have to tell you the false doctrine abounds. Everywhere you go, people will get disgruntled with the church and they start out a whole new different religion. Well, I'm just going to start my own religion. And what does that prove? That you're just foolish. <laughs> Instead of getting right and hearing the rebuke and, and trying to get right in the Word of God, It's sad. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. And Lord, I do pray that You keep me and this church from many false doctrines. You said the false prophets are many in this world. And Lord, I'm very careful when I pick out an evangelist or a missionary that I have here at this church. Lord, because I know that's true. I'm very careful before I let anybody come up here and preach because I know that Word is true. And help us be discerning of Your Word. 
Lord, help us to be as the Bereans, to search the Scriptures to see whether these things are so. And Lord, we love You. Thank You for having our best interest. Lord, we love You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to do a hymn of invitation here. Hymn number 149, Trusting Jesus. Hymn number 149, Are You Saved? Do you know you're saved? Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all. Thank you for listening. Hope it's been a help to your heart. And uh, we got to be careful. That's what I'm trying to say. And and uh, we certainly do, especially in this day and hour. I'm looking forward. I know the Lord's coming soon, and He'll deliver us out of all this mess. But till then, let us be in the Word of God and study in it, and keep our nose where it ought to be. Brother Sheely, close us out in a word of prayer, please. Well,